Welcome to the Chicago Bears Podcast. A presentation of ESPN Chicago, Chicago's home for sports. Here's your host, Pat, the designer. Bad on Bears fans, welcome in to a Wednesday edition of the Chicago Bears podcast. It's your boy, Pat the Designer, back at it again. Joined, as always, on a Wednesday by the man myth legend, Jason McKee, dominating the game as always. Jason, what's going on, baby? Man, not much. Happy to be here, man. Love getting the opportunity to, to link up with my guy, Pat, my guy, E, behind the scenes, making he sure always the podcast the you know, goes the right way. Yeah, uh, we're going to talk some Bears, man. Obviously, uh, you know, OTA started up, uh, some things going on there. But it's exciting because, you know, we're another step closer to the season. Because, hey, I'm telling you, when basketball season's over, you know, I'm kind of in withdrawal. <laughs> until hey, no. it's I a like lull. baseball. That's a lot of games, man. God, It's a lull. At least, base. I will say, baseball is a more palatable home watch now. So yeah. it does make it easier. Uh, just to get it out the way immediately, yes, I'm not in the ESPN State Street Studios because, uh, you know, we, we, we're not going to have them as a sponsor anyway. And if we were going to have them as a sponsor, they'd be late with the payment, just like my train was late today. Shout out to Metro <laughs> out here. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. I'm a little salty this morning. I got a little oh, salty man. in me, but it's all good, man. We're going to keep the – we still going to give you all a great show, man. A lot to get into. More OTA talk going to be breaking down – is there really issues with Jalen Johnson and Nate Davis not being there? Or is this OTAs and we're just overblowing this? Got to talk about uh, the feels the DJ Moore connection. Loving what we're seeing from that. Want to keep as much of that as possible inside of, of this locker room. I love that the, the bond that is being built here. Uh, Jason always talking about, right, like the the uh, connection that a team has and, and how that adds to the team as a whole. Uh, got to talk about Tremaine Evans talking about what makes a good defense. And then finally, if y'all watched Monday, uh, y'all know that we got a little bit of a question back and forth going on here between Lance and uh, Jason. So uh, we, we, we having some fun on this podcast, man. All that and more on today's yeah. episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Let's get into the show. First quarter. First quarter. So Jason, everybody's so upset. Mm-hmm. That people aren't showing up <laughs> to OTAs, the voluntary workout. And here's 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 my take on it, and and kind of how I, I want to get your opinion. One on because they weren't voluntary when you were playing, right? Like you had to show up to OTAs. It was mandatory, right? No, everything is voluntary. Voluntary, right? right voluntary, okay. mandatory. You know yeah, what I'm saying? But, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 a, it's a situation of. You know, if you if you listen to Phil's presser, and I know we're going to have that on here, and you know later on, but it's it's the new guys. Whether you're a free agent, and yeah, you may you may be a veteran free agent, but you're still new to this team. You're yeah. still new to this system. You're still new to this locker room. You know, you're still trying to embed yourself in this culture and understand what this culture is about in terms of what we're trying to build as a team. So your presence is mandatory. You know, and you know, for I'm, I'm talking in regards to Janae Davis. You know, I don't I don't know the situation, so I'm not in that locker room. I don't know if it's a personal issue. There's a lot of things that go on. You know, people got to understand that. Yeah, you're you're an athlete, but you're still a normal person. You still have an everyday life. You know, you yeah. still have a family. You know, you're still you know some of these guys. You know, they're they're having kids or different things pop up to where you can't be there. Uh, you know, in certain situations, so. I don't want to speculate and, and, and say he's not there because, I mean, he can't hold out. He just got a contract. But right. <laughs> I don't, you know what I mean, Pat? I don't know why he's not there. But in terms of if he if he's able to be there, he should be because, you yeah. know, you got to learn the playbook. you got to gel with the other offensive linemen in that offensive line room. you got a new offensive line coach. So you got to bond with your quarterback. And you got to be out there getting those live reps. It's one thing to – Look at your playbook on crazy thing. Most of these playbooks are on iPads right now, but it's it's you know it's one thing to look at your 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 playbook on an iPad and say okay I know what I got in this protection, yeah. but it's another thing to go out there and get a a good rep, a competitive rep against somebody that's rushing against you. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. and I know it's contact this contact less practice in OTAs right now, but you're still going to get a live rep, something that you can't do in your living room or your backyard or just looking at an iPad and saying, okay, I know what I got on this protection. 
I know the Nate Dave, the Nate Davis one. I, I I personally didn't think of it as a big deal. The part about Nate Davis that kind of stuck out to me is is when you when you listen to it, right? It, I don't know if it was a personal dig, if it was a dig at him, but you did hear Justin Fields say, you know, the people who need to be here are the new guys, the young yep. guys. They're the ones that need to learn the playbook. So your quarterback's telling you, hey, you guys need to be here. Now, again, like you said, behind the scenes, there might be something completely different going on where Justin Fields, right, he knows the situation. He knows that Nate's going to be there for this or, or, or he knows what's going on with Nate. We don't know. There could be a, a multitude of things that are happening. But it, it is interesting to see your quarterback kind of look at Nate, look, look at not Nate Davis, but all of the guys as a whole and say, you know, OTAs is voluntary. We kept hearing that yesterday in the press conferences. Mm -hmm. But it is beneficial for the new guys to be here and for uh, 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 the, the, the young guys to be here, the rookie guys. And I think that even with that, all your other new guys were there. For the most part, right? Like every everybody mm -hmm. else, Tremaine Edmonds, TJ Edwards, those guys were all in the building yesterday. Andrew Billings in the building yesterday. So Nate Davis kind of getting singled out on that as far as the new guys in the building. Yeah, and it's it's it just shows that you know now you have your quarterback taking another step in terms of development, right? We talk about him. We talk about working on the footwork and working on you know his fundamentals in the passing game. Well, now he's taking, you know, he's showing he's developed more as a leader, not necessarily. He didn't call out names in particular, but he did set a standard in place that's saying that, hey, if you're new, you need to be here. You need to get acclimated to this team. You need to get acclimated to this playbook. You need to get acclimated to this culture if we want to put a productive product on the field because we know we finished last year. We don't want to go back. We want to continue taking a step forward and all the momentum that they generated this offseason, you know, they've set themselves up to, to be able to uh, obviously surpass what they did last season. And, you know, these guys are hungry now. And if you're, if you're here working and you see your teammate isn't here putting in the same type of work that you're putting in, well, then how are you going to be able to produce on a high level? How are we going to build that chemistry? So I love the, the leadership aspect uh, uh, that Justin has displayed so far, saying that, hey, if you're new, you should be here. You know, voluntary is it's not voluntary, it's mandatory. And, and here's – so Nate Davis is definitely an interesting one. Another one that I thought was really interesting was the 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 visceral fury that everybody came out at with Jalen Johnson yesterday mm -hmm. uh, because of the contract situation, because of not to say that he's been a bad player. Right. But it, it's it seems like you haven't done enough to me for you to be having this situation. But again, get your money. Right. I'm not I'm never yeah. going to sit here and be like, hey, bro, don't don't get your bag. Like even when Roquan was doing it. I didn't agree with how he went about his business, but at the end of the day, it's his business. Get get your bag up. Here's my issue with, with Jalen Johnson. We've talked about all offseason. Me and you have talked about together, right? Jalen Johnson being a possible leader of this defense. Some of the leaders that are on this team, when I, when I think about it, right? Justin Fields, Cody Whitehair, Tremaine Edmonds. Those are really the leaders that you have right now. Guess what? They were all there yesterday. They all showed up yesterday. Even if you want to go down to some of the other guys that are just veteran guys in the room who are in a similar situation to what Jalen Johnson is in. Because I know the next thing is, well, his agent probably would tell him not to show up to that, not to show up for those situations, not to show up for voluntary things because you can get hurt. Chase Claypool was there. Yeah. Cole Komet was there. My issue is with you saying that you're going to be a leader of this team. To be a leader, you have to be there to lead. I don't care if it's voluntary. I don't care if it's, right, the offseason workouts, whatever it is, the smallest thing. Guess what? Tyreek Stevens needs that leader to be there so he knows what place he's going to be in. Kendall Vildor still needs his leader in the building. You can't be the leader of the DB room, and you're not there to lead. No, That's my issue with it. Yeah, 100 percent. You know, leadership is displayed on a daily basis, you know, and the difference you, you, you brought up Roquan, you know, Roquan, he was there. You know, we saw he, he did just, show up. Yes. He, he just didn't practice. So yeah. it's tough because all of these guys, they're 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 Well, they're, I believe did he skip OTAs or was he there at OTAs last year, too? Was he? I don't know. Was he there for both? I can't remember. I know he was. Well, training camp. Remember, he was there. I know he, training camp. He was on the side. They did right. like the 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 injured. Uh, yeah. They put him on the pup list, basically. Right. But like I believe said, he was there for OTAs, though. But go I think ahead. He was too. Hopefully, we're not wrong in this. We probably got to get some clarity on it. But 
in terms of leadership is displayed, right? And, yeah. you know, I don't, I hate speculating. It's still early, you know what I'm saying? And, and like we just talked about with Nate Davis, there are things that these players have, they have yeah. going on. But at the end of the day, you know, this, like, this is your job. This is important, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if he's already cleared that up with the Bears in terms of why he's not there right now. Um, you know, I hope he does, you know, get, even if it's a contract dispute, for his case, like you said, you're in, a, you're in a leadership role, whether you want to be in that role or not, because you're the elder statesman in that secondary. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So you've got to, you know, help these young guys. The young guys are going to look at you to help understand the defense more. Um, you know, you've got to be in there to help enforce the culture on a daily basis. Um, but at the same time, you know, I understand the contract piece of it, but what's what's more important, right? You're trying to go out there and, and you're trying to 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 gain wins. If you look at Justin Fields. They asked him during his press conference uh, the other uh, yesterday. They asked him, "Hey, are you worried about a contract?" He said, "I'm not worried about a contract. I'm worried about wins because yeah. the more you win, the fatter that contract will get. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the more wins you have, the more of an important piece you are to that team, to that found, to that foundation of winning. So, you know, I'm, I, I hope it's you know, I hope he's getting better advice. I hope he shows up because he's definitely an, an important piece. And you know, if you want to go out there and you want to earn a contract, well. It's more than just your play on the field. It's the value they see, the value you bring in terms of you being in that building, the value you bring in terms of you elevating the play of the guys around you. You know, so those are all important things that you're evaluated on when you're trying to get a new contract. Yeah, and and I mean, realistically, right, when you think about it, the lack of leadership oftentimes can breed a leader. Yeah. In the person that you didn't expect to be a leader, because somebody's got to step up in that role where you're not there, which it, which I guess in a sense might be good, right? Like if you end up with another leader on this team as, in, in the DB room, but now you're sitting there talking about, okay, now we got two guys that may have conflicting opinions. Now I f I feel like you're opening yourself up to an opportunity to create. I don't want to say a division early, but right where you create that. I think back to the when Kyrie Irving was on the Boston Celtics. Mm -hmm. Kyrie Irving, clear leader of that team. When he's healthy, they're rolling. They're, they're flying through the season. Jason Tatum's a rookie that year. All of a sudden, Kyrie gets hurt. He's not able to play. Jason Tatum, and and uh, I think Jalen Brown was on that team too. Maybe not. Uh, I don't know what year. I don't remember what year. But, but Jason Tatum, as a rookie, leads the Boston Celtics to the NBA Eastern Conference Finals. They lose to LeBron in, I believe, six or seven. And at the end of that, Jason Tatum, didn't want Kyrie Irving as his leader because he felt like I'm good enough to lead this team. Yeah. Why should I listen to you? That's the kind of division. Now he has going back on that. I, I, at the end of the day, he was like, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Kyrie kind of helps. But I, I think at, at the end of the day, the, the point is right. Like you create a situation where now there is no fixed point. You create another fixed point. Now you got everybody in the DB room, possibly looking at two different sides here that might have conflicting opinions. Now, hopefully everybody's on the same page, but that, that's not always the case. Yeah, you, you, you're right. You bring you bring division, but you also bring distraction, right? So the distraction is, you know, when I'm after practice, you know, I'm answering questions about why you're not here instead of talking about our team and how we're, and what we're doing to get better, what yeah. we're doing to take the next step. You know what I'm saying? Like even Coach Flues, you know, he wants to talk about his team. He wants to talk about the new pieces and how practice went and what they've been doing this off season. But instead, you know, he's being asked questions about a player that's not there. So you don't want unnecessary distractions. You know, you got a lot on your plate right now. You're trying to gel as a, as a team. You're trying to get ahead in this playbook. So that way you can continue taking steps forward uh, to being the best version of yourself when the season kicks off. So you, those unnecessary distractions or distractions are something that you don't want. And that's what happens when you have a situation like this. And we don't know what the situation really is right now. We can't yeah. say it's a contract holdout because it's still early. But like yeah. we said, when when guys, notable guys, notable leaders of this team aren't present, is gonna aren't present, it's gonna bring about distractions. And we're already starting to see it early. And that's something that and I know this organization does not want. Well, I think you also have to look at the fact too that right, like Flus <laughs> He didn't give a reason why he wasn't there, right? And he he didn't say that he had any indication that he was going to skip mini camp or skip a uh, training camp or not mm -hmm. skip training camp. I doubt he will. Um, his contract ain't that big, and the fine is pretty hefty. Uh, if you if you skip the oh, mandatory yeah. stuff, so <laughs> so I doubt he's going to skip that, right? Like Roquan was in a little bit of a different situation. Roquan has mm -hmm. some bread to spend, uh, mm -hmm. and and Roquan, I mean, realistically, here's the tough part. 
Roquan was more valuable to the Chicago Bears then than Jalen Johnson is now. And you yeah. hate to say it that way, but realistically, I like Jalen Johnson, but Jalen Johnson is a necessity on this team because of the depth that this team has at the DB position, not yeah. because of his stellar play on the field. There's multiple games where 100-plus yards have been given up on Jalen Johnson just last season. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's not, he's, he's an above-average DB that I think is taking advantage of of the situation that the Bears are in. If there is a contract issue, this is the best time for you to voice your opinion because you know realistically they really only have two starting DBs or two starting That's cornerbacks, correct. I should say, that are that are going to slot in there and make you feel comfortable. But I think the the big thing for me at, at, at the end of all of this, kind of to, to put a, a, a dot on the eye, is if he's not showing up in these moments, and Flus is saying, we haven't had these conversations. His hand is fine. Everything seems good. He could be here, but it's voluntary. That's telling you a lot about what the coach believes in with you already. I think yeah. that it's telling you a lot, especially coming from where he came from last year. Remember, Flus wasn't sold on him. Remember, Jalen Johnson was working with the twos. Yeah. Right. And everybody was like, that's not a big deal. No, that's a big deal. We didn't have nobody. And Jalen Johnson's working with the twos. Yeah. And and like you and to your point, like you said, you know, you want you want a new contract, right? Well, let's improve my value on a daily basis, but I gotta yeah. be here to do that. You know, let me let me let me increase the value of, of, of my earning potential in terms of me showing leadership in this building every day, me outworking everybody, right? me bringing along the young guys, but then going on the field, you know, in OTAs, and I know no contact right now, but let me go out on the field and make play after play after play and show that, hey, we can't move forward in this defense without having a key piece like Jalon Johnson. And yeah. the only way you're going to increase that value is by being there, is yeah. by being there and doing those things necessary to do so. A hundred percent. I I just, it, and especially, right, like this is your first time to do it with a def defensive line. Yeah. Again, right? Like all the, it's funny because like we look at Justin Fields and we say you can answer all the questions this season because you have receivers, offensive line, possibly uh, uh, um, running game, all of that, right? I look at Jalen Johnson the same way. Listen, I understand that I shouldn't expect you to have uh, um, 17 interceptions at this point in your career because there's been no defensive line, no pressure on the quarterback, and you've had to cover guys for seven plus seconds. Mm -hmm. I get all of that. But at the end of the day, now you got to show me that and dispel all of that with what's actually here now. Because now I think you have a defensive line that I don't know if they'll get a ton of sacks, but I do believe they'll create more pressure than we saw last season. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, the good thing is you have on this roster, right? Uh, I think what they've done a great job of this offseason is, is bringing, in, bringing in talent that's yeah. in great competition, right? So now guys – guys who were starters last year, last year didn't have to look over their shoulder and say, am I going to be the starter, you know, week in and week out. Now they have to do that because if you're not practicing well, you're not playing well, you've got a guy behind you that can come in. And if you outplayed you, that can possibly take your spot. So yeah. the, th the threat of competition uh, brings out the best. It's going to elevate everybody on the team because now, you know, you have to go out there and put your best foot forward on a daily basis. You know, you've got to outwork guys in meetings. I got to take more notes on this guy, right? I've got to be, I've got to answer more questions during film study with this guy, right? But not only yeah. that, now I've got to take all of those things that I learned in meetings, and I've got to take that to the practice field because I got to I got to work this guy in practice, and then I got to take what I've done on the practice field and take that to the game field because if I'm not out working this guy on all those phases, well then now he has the talent enough to t overtake my job. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's what these guys now you have healthy competition at all these positions. You know, we talked about it a few weeks ago at the running back position. You got all these running backs. Everybody wants to be the lead back. So they know they got to go out there. I Khalil Herbert, I've got to step up in pass protection because they drafted a guy in the fourth round that excels in pass protection. Yeah. You know, I've got to be able to run physical because now we got Deontay Foreman that can run in between the tackles like a madman. You know, so even in the receiver room, you know, we got DJ Moore in his receiver room. So now we all have to elevate our play because we know what he can do. We've seen what he's done in the past. We know what he's capable of doing and what he will do this year, but I've got to ele elevate my game. Baylor Jones, they got all these new receivers they brought in. You know, I, I got a possibility that I may not be on this roster. I've got to go yep. out here every day and outwork, you know, Tyler Scott. I've got to outwork even a Chase Claypool, guys who you may not 
be directly competing with, but I got to outwork them in every phase of the game, meetings, film study, practice, and then take all of that work and, and, and take it to the field. Um, you know, offensive lines the same, every position. I mean, there's competition at, at every level is, of this football team, and that's what Poles has done. He's brought in young guys, right, that have the ability and talent to go out there and, and, and be successful. So competition breeds success, and that's what they've done this offseason, brought in a lot of competition. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. I hope, I hope that, and, and listen, Flus did give. I love let yesterday where he's like, they asked them like, "Hey, who are some of the rookies that came in the most prepared?" And he's like, "Well, I'm not gonna give anybody individual praise." By the way, Tyreek Stevenson was a dog out there. You know, I really love what I saw from him. I like, gave like four guys individual praise, but uh, man, listen, you you mentioned the wide receivers uh, in the competition that's there. Let's get into the second quarter because I think we got a really good topic here. Second quarter. Second quarter. As we get into the fact that Justin Fields and DJ Moore Mm -hmm. working together, starting to play better, starting to, right? Like it's just the beginning process, but they're not sugarcoating it. I love these two guys. One, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie. I know we say this about every like 5'10 wide receiver that plays for the Carolina Panthers at any point. Mm-hmm. He really reminds me of Steve Smith, though, like his actual personality, like the confidence yeah. in himself, how he's out there. Like he's just, he's laughing and joking with the media. But what they said yesterday was so real to me where it wasn't where Sugar Coat in his office. He said, no, it's, it's a it's a work in progress. The, the, the way he broke down um, DJ Moore as a receiver, you know, he said he had yeah. strong hands. He said he runs great routes, but he said not only does he run, he runs great routes. He understands, based upon the route concept call, how to tempo his routes. So sometimes there's routes that you run that don't require you to run full speed. They yeah. require you to, to do things with timing and making sure you're in the right place, um, you know, based upon the right coverage. And he said that DJ Moore's mental makeup of the game gives him the ability to be able to do all of those things. And then yeah. he talks about him being a, you know, a tough guy, you know, willing to make those tough catches and things like that. So. When you look at the makeup of DJ Moore and, you know, you look at all those athletic qualities that he possesses combined with the mental makeup of the game, that's why he's been successful. And, you know, he's a guy, he's from Philly. And, you know, I went to school at Temple University, Philadelphia. Philadelphia is a, is a hard nose, you know, blue collar city, you know, got people, hardworking people. <laughs> he's, he's, one guys. You know, he's one of those, those, those Philadelphia players that come out and they're just, you know, they're not prima donnas. They're hungry yeah. about production. And you can see that with him. He's not a prima donna. He just wants to go out and make plays for his team. He's gritty. And I think that's the type of receiver that you need to be, that you need here in Chicago. You need that type of guy that can display those qualities because those those qualities display leadership, right? He's not worried about, hey, I need to get my 10 catches, right? I'm going out here. I need to make plays. I may have to get hit over the middle. I may have to, you know, break a tackle here or there. But I'm out, I'm out here to make plays on a daily basis for my team. And I think his level of play and showing that type of ability is going to matriculate down to all those guys in that receiver room. Yeah. And, and I think that the the other part that really stood out to me that got me excited about what Justin said was the improvement that he saw from Chase Claypool Yep, and in the mentality and how he's attacking and how he's approaching the game. Right. Remember Courtney brought it out yesterday I, and, and I kind of, I guess I'd kind of put it out of my mind because at that point, the Bears were so far out of it. I was disgusted by everything that I was seeing at that point. But I forgot right in that Detroit game, Chase Claypool kind of had a meltdown on the sideline where he's like slamming the helmet. He's he's Mm -hmm. visibly upset. And and he said at the end of the day, he was upset because one, he doesn't like to lose. And two, because he knew that he wasn't playing up to the standard. Justin Fields comes over to him immediately. Hey, listen, this is how we do things. Blah, blah, blah. This is what we're going to make happen. Blase, blase, right? Like he's having this conversation with him on the sideline, getting him back in order. And realistically, that's the kind of leader that you want on this team. That's how you want this to trickle out to your wide receivers. Now we're hearing that Chase Claypool has made those adjustments, made has has a better mentality, uh, is coming out a little uh, uh, with an understanding of the playbook, and you got the competition factor, like you talked about earlier, with DJ Moore in the building. Yeah, I think that these guys are going to push each other so far because I said this right, like when I hear Justin talk about that yesterday, to me that tells me that C, uh, uh, Chase Claypool really has a real opportunity to be your number two in this offense. And I, I know a lot of people are like, of course, you traded the second for him. That doesn't mean that he's going to be just in second favorite. 
You know what I mean? Like that's that's really what it comes down to. We know how he feels about Darnell Mooney. We know that he rocks with Mooney. Him and Moon Man have been really close. He said Moon Man has been a, a big instru uh, instrumental in his um transfer into the NFL from college and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I always thought, right, like Darnell Mooney's probably going to be his second favorite option here. I hear that yesterday and it tells me, and I get Mooney not there, that could make a big a, a difference in that situation. But I hear that yesterday and it tells me, right, like, okay, I know that I have this option here as well. And this is probably going to be a big option for me to go to with DJ Moore, who is, I guess, like this man, he said he never is going to have to run 100%. That's the craziest statement I've heard. I, I now nah, listen, Tyreek Hill is definitely faster than DJ Moore, but he's never gonna have to run a hundred percent. Is crazy, just because he's got another gear that he can go to. <laughs> yeah, and and at the end of the day, right? Offices aren't just go routes. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah, yeah. you're not gonna like all these routes. It means these receivers, you know, that like he said, he's he's good at tempoing routes. So what's the way that you have to run the route tree? There's a there's a difference in the way you run a dig from the way you run a slant from the way yeah. you run a drag. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, all those things. And he has an understanding of that based upon the offense, based upon the route concept call. So, and, and, and these routes, these same routes I'm, I'm talking about are also ran differently versus different coverages. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's having that understanding as a whole in terms of, okay, I've got to run my slant route differently against this coverage. You know, I've got to run my slant route difference if it's different, if it's cover two compared to if it's man. You know what I'm saying? If it's man, I know yeah. I got to beat that defender across his face. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's all of these things, right? That and, and it goes back to Justin Fields. It's all of these things that that help you mature and help you grow. Being being is your second year in the system. These are things you understand more, right? These are things now that you're able to do like it's second nature as opposed to having to think about it. And then process it and then go out there and, and execute it being your first year in this offense you know now it's the second year of growth in this offense and these are things that you just understand more it makes you play faster having an understanding of the offense when you can understand concepts and protections and and especially for running backs you know what's my read on on this in terms of this play you know what's my read on this who am i reading uh you know if i'm running outside zone inside zone or if I'm running you know, power or gap scheme, you know, things of that nature. So this is going to help guys play faster. But at the same time, in order for us to play faster, like we talked about it when we first started the show, those new guys have to be here to understand this stuff yeah. because some of these guys are going to be starters and it's their first year in the system. So you got some guys first year, some guys second year. And we all want to be on one accord. We all want to be on the same page because offense is like a clock. And that's what I always say. When we have a clock, right? If you don't have, if one piece isn't working on that clock, it's not going to tick. You know what I'm saying? So offensively, I need all 11 guys to be ticking at the same time. We all got to have one heartbeat to execute yeah. one play, to execute one play. Because in this yeah. in this league, you can have the perfect game, right? But it always comes down to, you know, one play here, one play here, one turnover here. You know what I'm saying? That really determines the outcome of the game. And you don't want to be that that piece, that, right, that failed, at, 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 at a, uh, a key moment of the game that that's going to get you in the losing column instead of the win column. So I think when you look at all of those things, that's why you have Justin saying we need these guys here because our guys who have been here in this system, we're growing. Yeah. New guys, you're going to be behind. No matter if you're a fourth-year guy, fifth-year guy, if you're new to this team, you're going to be behind because this is a new offense. And we need you to get here. We need to gel as teammates. We need to be on the same page. So that way, when we go out on that football field, we're all one heartbeat. We're all on one accord. So that way we can go out there and we can execute at a high level. You know, all these other teams are doing the same thing right now. So what can we do as a team to make sure that we're staying ahead of Green Bay? What can we do as a team to make sure we're staying ahead of Detroit? What can we do as a team to make sure we're staying ahead against the Minnesota Vikings or anybody that we're going to uh, line up against? Because everybody right now is doing the same thing. And what these coaches are trying to do, they're trying to gain some type of competitive edge on a daily basis. So that's that's where we're at right now. That's what you know OTAs is about. But yeah. the, the better the attendance you have, right, the better opportunity you have hitting the ground running when mini camp happens, hitting the ground running when training camp happens. So you want to try to stay ahead of the competition. Yeah, 100%. Y'all heard it here first. Uh, Coach McKee, big on uh, one band, one sound out here. Yes, Shout sir. out to Drumline. <laughs> <laughs> one band. Well, I've seen that, that movie so right many there, times, bro. I've seen it <laughs> so 
many times. I was I, I grew up playing in the drum line, so like that was like the go to movie, and we had to know every cadence from the movie, and it was too much, too much. Don't you hey, got man. Drums? You said you have drums in your studio, right? Don't you got drums back there, man? Oh yeah, I grew I grew up drumming, man. The music was my <laughs> music is my first love. It ain't was my oh. first love. I got into content creation when I got sick of going into music studios and being like, hey man, it's a lot of weed in here. I don't even smoke like that, bro. Like I'm high. Like I don't want to be here no more. <laughs> you want me to write raps right now? You want me to write you, right man. now? You want me to play the drums? I can't I'm even find you. the sticks right now. <laughs> that is hilarious, man. <laughs> hey man, let's keep this thing moving along as we get the halftime on the show. Yeah. Jason, you got anything you want to give a shout out to at halftime? Yeah, man. Just uh had an opportunity to spend some time in Arizona this past weekend. Uh, beautiful city of Scottsdale was great. Uh, it's a good time. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever been out there, but if you haven't, make sure you get out there. Yeah. A lot of good things going on in Scottsdale. Uh, Arizona is extremely hot, too hot. You know, I, I uh, <laughs> attempted to golf, but uh, it was too hot, man. I was, you know, and I'm not that good at golf to be golfing in a hundred degree uh, to weather, weather, man. So, uh, shout out to Scottsdale. It was, it was a great time, man. Shout, shout out to Scottsdale. I was so hot the entire time. I didn't want to be there anymore. <laughs> up, man. Up, man. I, tried, it, I was cool. I mean, it was great. Like it was, it was great. You know, me and me and a couple of the fellas got out there. Um, Rasheed Davis played yeah. in the receiver with us for the Bears. Ahmad Merritt played here uh, with the Bears for a long time. Two of my buddies. So got to hang out, got the fellowship, man. And anytime you get to do that and, and get a break from from coaching. You know, like, like I've been doing the last few weeks, we've had you know almost four coaches a day visiting the school. Yeah. Um, so you, sometimes you got to you got to get a break, man. I didn't I didn't have to go to OTA, so I was able just to leave and <laughs> do whatever I want. I had I had my time <laughs> doing all that stuff. So I was I was I was a, I was a no show for a weekend, man. Hey, man. Hey, it's all good, man. Listen, it was it was voluntary. It was yeah, voluntary. Man. We're not sure what's going on with his hand, but it was voluntary. Yeah. That's how we're gonna say. <laughs> hey, doing, doing the Scottsdale was mandatory. Though. So Going to Scottsdale was mandatory. That was your mini camp. That was that was your OTAs right there. What's exactly. uh? I feel like Scottsdale is one of them spots. Is good good nightlife in Scottsdale? Yeah, it was nice, man. They got it's uh it, it, it's different, obviously, because it's good nightlife. Um, you know, all the hotels they got a, a good pool scene. Yeah, um, good people. But the funny thing is, and you know, Ahmad married. He has a house out there, so he kept telling us. The funny thing is, he's like. He's like, a lot of these people down here, they all gravitate from Chicago. Like, so he said, there's a lot of Chicago people. Like, we went to a bar uh, to watch one of the basketball games, and it was a Chicago Bears bar, which is weird. Like, yeah. you know, you walk in, and they've got, you know, the pizza and all the Chicago food, and they got the Bears flags everywhere. So I thought that was pretty cool. Like, he said, there's a lot of Chicagoans down in, in Scottsdale, in the Scottsdale area. Yeah, I got I got, I'm pretty sure my family's in Scottsdale. We got family out that way where they, they, Grew up here in Chicago, and they said we sick of winter, so they went to the hottest place on earth. So they just decided, you know, like I said before, right? The sun was all booked up, so they said Scottsdale is the uh, the next best thing. That's how it felt to me. I don't know. I, I I'm a big seasons guy. Yeah. Like by the time I get to the end of summer, I look forward to the beginning of winter, not the end of winter. I look forward to like that beginning where it's like the nice snowfall. You know, I get to use my snowblower, little stuff like that. And then we start to get in the cold, cold areas. Like, I right, bet I'm I'm ready for summer again. But like, yeah. but you know, I'm I'm ready for fall. I like the change. I don't like hot every day. Yeah, it's hot, man. And, and the crazy thing is too, like, and I know somebody from Scottsdale is probably gonna try to crucify me right now. But <laughs> where, where we stayed, where we stayed, it was it was weird because like, you know, you you drive around and you're used to seeing grass, you used to yeah. see lawns and stuff like that. Well, their lawn is like rocks. Like it's rocks. Like. You know what I'm saying? Their their landscape is rocks and cactuses yeah. and stuff like that. I'm like, well, where's the grass at? Like, there, there's no. Is it too hot to have grass? It's too there? hot to have grass out there, dog. That's I ain't gonna funny. lie to you, man. Like, it, we they they said it's there's a Chicago mantra that we all chant every winter. We'll have tornadoes. We'll have earthquakes. We'll have snakes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I stay, I stay here for the, I stay here for them reasons, bro. Because I swear, <laughs> the one time I was in Arizona, I heard. Yeah, yeah. I said, "What the heck is that?" Somebody's like, "Oh, it's just a rattler." <laughs> it's, all, it's just a rattler, let me, right? Let me go. Listen, I like I like animals, right? I'm I like animals, but but come on, dog. Right. 
people die from that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm out of here, man. Hey, let's keep it going. Let's keep it moving along. Good to have you back. Glad you survived Scottsdale. And it was great, but it was hot. Uh, let's get to this third quarter because third quarter. Uh, as, as we talked about the offense, talked about the growth on offense, we also talked about some of the pieces that were missing in the leadership on the defensive side of the ball. But there was leadership in the building yesterday. What gets you excited about how Tremaine Edmonds was talking about being a leader on this defense and what it takes for a defense to click? Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to what we've been talking about all offseason in terms of, you know, more so the off the field things, right? The chemistry, the bonding with your teammates, getting doing things outside of the facility so that way you understand the man who you're going to be lining up with during the yeah. season. You know, those are things that help breed success. And, you know, I saw that with our defense. And, you know, you can ask Briggs, like, you know, him and Peanut, Peanut were inseparable. You know what I'm saying? Him, Peanut, Erlach, or like all the all the D linemen were always together. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They were eating together, they were moving together, they would gang up on the running back and try to crack jokes against us. You know what I'm saying? Like all of that stuff, you know, all did of that they win? Did they win? Did now, they have we, better jokes? No, nah, I think the running back room, man, I think we hit we might have been the biggest jokesters, man. We <laughs> won those battles. So Briggs will probably argue that, but he knows the real deal. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get T Jones on here and I'll get some of my guys to validate that point. Hey, hey, I need some validation <laughs> out here, man. <laughs> but, uh, no, and, and I like that, you know, Tremaine's he came from Buffalo from a defense that had to grow as well. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and you, if you listen to what he was saying in that press conference, he was saying that they had guys that were in that system for a long time. And he said it started out where they were, they wanted to be. No, but as they grew and got comfortable in that system, as we began to bond and gel and to know each other off the field, the production picked up on the field. And I think that's what, you know, I, I'm glad he's been a part of a defense that had to grow and build because now he can come here and he's a part of a defense that has success, right? Yeah. In order to be successful, you gotta, you gotta know, you gotta know what success looks like. Right. And I think he's seen that in Buffalo and now he can bring those qualities here to a young defense in Chicago. And he's doing, and he said, it's starting with, guys you know understanding and knowing uh each other off the field and i think you know that's going to create good competition on the field because hey we know this defense is about getting takeaways he had one the other day and when you see one, when you see one of your guys get a takeaway you know that that competition starts brewing you know i want to be the next person to get one and i got to yeah. get a, i got a force from i got to get a pick and i got to make a tackle for loss so that that's good to see that you know this defense you know is these guys are starting to jump early and that's another reason why your presence is necessary at LTH. Your presence is necessary in the offseason. Your presence is necessary in minicamp because yeah. you've got to bond with the guys you're going to line up against during the season. How how much, right, we always hear about that, that he's going to bring that culture here. And, and I feel like I rarely see it happen, um, usually because the culture is something that is a part of the group that's there, the coaching staff that's there, the bonds that are built, like you said. How much can you actually bring one culture from another? Um, you've seen a lot of pieces come in and out where they just – and I feel like there's certain guys that are the culture and there's certain guys that were a part of the culture. Mm -hmm. Jimmy Butler, to me, is a guy that is, is the culture. Everywhere right. he goes, he instills his way. How often do you see that in the NFL, though? Yeah, so like you said – some guys are the culture and some guys are a part of the culture. So how I would break that down is, right, if you're a guy that is that is the culture, right, you're you're the alpha, right? You're yeah. setting the standard every day. Hey, defense, you know, our goal, we're going to get three turn turnovers in practice today. You know, defense, we're going to get, you know, we're going to stop them three and out today. You know what I mean? Now, if you're just a part of, I think if you're a guy who's more so a part of that culture, well, you're more so a guy that's going to lead by example. You know, you're going to, you're going to be a guy that, that's displaying the hits principle every day in practice. Yeah. You're a guy that's going to, you know, if, if if you're the first guy in the meeting room, the last guy out, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're displaying leadership. You're displaying it in the things that you do in your actions. You're not so, you're not more so a vocal guy, but you're displaying, you know, that culture and that leadership uh, through your actions. So that's kind of the way that I would explain that. Like there's not a lot of guys who, you know, some guys aren't comfortable being that vocal guy, yeah. so, you know, the rah-rah guys. And some guys are more comfortable just leading by example, you know, just going in there, doing what they're supposed to do, being a pro's pro. Uh, and, and some guys, when they see that, they want to emulate that. And I think that's the difference between 
you know, being a guy who is who is the culture and being a guy who's just a part of the culture. Yeah, it, it's how do you whose job is it, I guess, is the question I should ask to, to set that now, because realistically, right, no matter how much this team hopefully has improved this season, the culture of this team right now is a three and 13 team. That's the, mm-hmm. And it felt like they had a good vibe around it. it was, it's it's weird. Somebody I think I think Courtney said this uh, yesterday. She was like, I've been around bad teams. And it was weird. Like it was a three and thirteen team, but you would have thought that they won more games than they did because of the vibe around the team. Whose job is it coming into this season to set that culture? Are you putting that on the players? Are you putting that more on the coaching staff to say, "Hey, listen, yes, these are our expectations, but also, right, like this is how we want you guys to execute our expectations." Yeah, and I think it's it, that's a great question, and I think it's it's a uh, so I'll start with this, like. The head coach, right? You establish what the culture is. You establish what the expectation is. You have what you call your non-negotiables, right? We're not going to walk in practice. We're going to hustle from drill to drill. We're going to practice fast. We're going to get, you know, come out here, practice fast. We're off the field. We're going to recover. You know, you set those non-negotiables as a team, right? But then the great teams are player-led, right? So mm-hmm. if 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 my team is player-led, then that culture and those non-negotiables that I just talked about that, that coach flues, you know, has to have in place. It's got to be player led. The players got to enforce it on a daily basis because when you have culture, right? Culture is, it's a word, it's cliche, but culture is a living thing. It's something that you have to, you know, day in and day out, you have to live and breathe culture every day. And once the standard slips then it's gone, you know, if you get one guy walking and coach flues allows it, right. Then other guys start doing that. But then the whole standard and all those yeah. non-negotiables and those principles that you set in place, those things all slip because now guys are going to start doing what they want. You know, right. it has to be an expectation. When you hit that practice field, we're going at her to win every rep. We're going at her to win the practice. All right. If we have a better practice today than Green Bay did, we won the day. We won the day. Yeah. And when you start stacking days like that, that's going to elevate your team to the next level. That's going to enable you to go out there and win at home and open, opener against Green Bay. You know, those details, those fine details that you have to harp on on a day in and day out, those are the makings of a great team. You know what I'm saying? Great teams don't cut corners, right? Great teams, they don't shy away from controversy. Great teams don't shy away from adversity. Great teams attack controversy. Great teams attack adversity together. And I think that's what, you know, in terms of who's in charge of, you know, setting the standard. The coach sets the standard. But the great teams are player led and the players have to execute that standard and that culture on a daily basis. Yeah. And I I think it's it's one of those things that I here's the part that does get me excited. I liked it. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing it from Justin now. Justin's the clear leader of this team right now. Right. Like Mm -hmm. and, and I know people last year were like, well, Justin's a leader because of necessity. No, Justin actually just is a leader. Right? Like he walks in a room, he he exudes leadership. When you see him, he's telling this team what they what ex, what's expected of them. I think even going out right, like again, I don't know if it was a personal shot that Nate Davis or not, but the fact that he pointed out that the only people that need to be at OTAs, right? He kind of he almost kind of was like, Jalen's doing his own thing. It is what it is. The people that need to be at OTAs are the new guys and the young guys. And I mean, like that is. Mm-hmm. Right, letting Nate Davis know, hey, listen, you're protecting me on the right side. You yeah. need to be here. Yeah. Whether it's a shot or not, just saying that is you need to understand what we have going on here. And you're not here to learn that when all of these other guys are. So I think that, right, th- I think that the fact that we have these leaders coming out now early on in the process, right? Like you can speak to it, right? Like, I mean, you guys, Super Bowl year. I'm I'm very sure that even in the earliest stages of that season, you guys were on top of everything. There wasn't cutting quarters. There wasn't doing not doing the little things. The little things lead to the bigger things getting done. Yeah, definitely. And you know, it goes back to being like I said, player led. You had leaders within that locker room, and I know we talk about it time and time again, but it's it's a fact that you know, Lovey did a good job of laying out the expectations, laying out the framework of of about you know, how he wanted things to run, how he wanted his team to operate, you know, on all three phases, offense, defense, special team, you know, how he wanted us to practice. Um, and we had great leaders within that organization, within that locker room that did a good job of enforcing that. So if we weren't practicing well, you know, we had leaders step up like an only crew to say, hey, this is, this is BS. You know, let's start this period over. Yeah. You had guys, you know, 
you know, starting practice over that were coaches. You didn't have to have the coach do it. You had players doing it because they said, this isn't good enough. You know, that blitz period wasn't good enough. You know, our quarterback would have been sacked three times. We're yeah. going to start this over. Even though practice is, typically, is almost over, we're going to run that back. You know what I'm saying? Because we got to run it back now because at kickoff on Sunday, we're not going to be able to run that back. We ain't going to get that rep back. So we got to yeah. perfect it now. So that way we have a, a chance at perfecting it on Sunday. So when you have that type of leadership and that type of standard being upheld on a daily basis by the players, that makes you an elite team because elite, had, elite teams is player led. Yeah. You had Lovey and you had Andy Reid. How often did you see that happen? Where Same the coach thing. just was like, hey, man, listen, <laughs> he said run it back, run it back. Yeah. I mean, and, and the good thing for me is in my career, you know, I, I was blessed to be around so many great coaches. My first yeah. year you mentioned Andy Reid, it was, he had so many veterans on that team. You had Brian Dawkins, Hall of Famer. You had Troy Vincent, was was one of the corners. Um, you know, you had Deuce Staley, Brian Mitchell, you know, guys with Donovan McNabb, great leaders, you know, who who were pros, pros, and guys who wasn't going to let things slip, guys who practiced, you know, guys who had contract, big contract, but practiced like they didn't have anything. You know, Brian Dawkins, I remember, Brian Dawkins was our slot on the punt team. You know what I mean? And he's running down full speed. I mean, this is special teams. It's not even his face. He was he was the slot on the punt team, and he's running down like he's a, a undrafted free agent trying to make the team. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And when you have guys practicing that way, right, guys who are already established, but they're still practicing every single rep, even if it isn't their, their main phase of the game, that matriculates to the young guys. And it, and, it, and it helped me because when I saw him out there, you know, I'm like, man, I'm going – you know, I'm I'm going out here with my with my head on fire. I'm gonna cause a wreck. You know what I'm saying? That's that's what that's what my old high school coach used to say. But I'm going out here and I'm gonna make a play. You know what I mean? Because I see yeah. all these veterans out here practicing hard, playing hard, upholding the standard. You know what I'm saying? They're at they're in, in meetings early. They're taking notes. They're answering questions. You know, they're asking me questions to see if I'm understanding the offense or if I'm understanding the special teams and things like that. So when you have guys displaying that type, those type of qualities within your locker room, that breeds success. That's what makes a championship team. When you have a bunch of guys who are just selfish, worried about themselves, worried about their own production, worried about their own contract, well, guess what? Those are the teams, right, that, that aren't good. Those are the teams that are at the bottom of the barrel <laughs> year in and year out. Yeah, we, we've, we've seen some. We've seen yeah. some, unfortunately, here. Hopefully yeah. that's not uh, where we're at. I think that we're in a much better place here. I think that we have a, we have a team that, um, it, it seems like it's not fake. I think that's the biggest thing for me. It's not like, it's not like they, again, I said this, right? Like I've heard this so many times, especially with like Matt Nagy when he was here or name whatever coach you want after Levy Smith, basically, where the culture is great. We love these guys. We're having a great day in practice. We're doing everything that we need to do, blah, blah. And then you go out there and you get 50 put on your head. Yeah. Right. Like, and, and realistically, it, me, it tells me that everything that you told me was a lie. Yeah. And that yeah. the culture is not great because you got 50 put on your head. Not to say that good teams don't get 50 put on their head, but, you know, it shouldn't happen twice in between a bye week. Can you tell that stuck out in my head? Uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> what, you point two right there, Pat, you look at it too. You can, the, the, the film ain't going to lie, right? So it's one thing to, you, you can, even, even in, in a blowout and a loss, you can tell if a team has, a great standard in place, right? A great culture yeah. in place, right? And I'll go with the defensive side of the ball, right? You may be getting beat, you know, you may be getting blown out 50 to nothing, right? Maybe the fourth quarter, you know, two minutes left, right? Or all 11 guys still running to the ball. Regardless of the score, yeah. right? All 11 guys around the ball, running to the ball, still playing fast, still playing physical, regardless of the score. Because there's yeah. going to be games, right? You can have, you can be a team that has great culture, great everything. You're going to have games where you just get beat sometimes. But at the yeah. same time, are you still uh, exemplifying those principles on the field on, on, on uh, every single play, playing yeah. fast, playing physical? You know what I'm saying? Those are the things that you see. Is the is the offensive lineman running down, picking up the running back? You know what I'm saying? Those are those are the things that you see that that kind of shows you. All right. These guys understand what the standard is, regardless of the score. You know, they understand the culture. They understand what our team is about. Right. His principle that that Eva Flues has up there that he talks about all the time is that being displayed every single play. That's that's how you determine whether a team has great culture. You know what I'm saying? Regardless of the score. Hey, let's hope that we got that here, man. Four quarters.
Let's get into this fourth quarter, though, because I have to ask you about this, Lance. We, so I don't know if y'all know this. We got an in, inside. I don't know if I call it beef. It's not beef, but it's definitely banter. It's some solid banter. Let's call it baloney. It's not beef. It's baloney. You know what I mean? It's, it's not all the way up there, but yeah. it's, it, it's being thrown back and forth. So we brought the Adrian Peterson story to Lance. Bridge got he got mad because I, I I don't know if he he didn't get mad but it was it was one of those right oh he bringing up my stories huh so he told us to ask you about the time where you got in his words took the church that's <laughs> that's, that's, church. that's how that's how he described it he said at the end of the day I I didn't know there was beef because you asked me <laughs> who was the best player I seen and I said and yeah. all, you know what I mean but. If you want beef, then we can have beef. I don't. I don't. There's I no don't beef. There's no me. beef. There's no beef. Nah, nah, there's a I, I, I there's cold cuts at most. <laughs> <laughs> I don't shy away from no beef. So, but now, Bridge is my guy. But yeah, man, shoot, I we man, I've got I got crushed like a can. Everybody's been hit. You know what I mean? You're gonna yeah. lose something. You're gonna lose something. I got yeah. shoot. There was a time like I got knocked out for a half, came back and played the rest of the half. But you know, and nowadays that's illegal. So. In a yeah. fair, you owe me some money because uh, I probably shouldn't have played the rest of that game. And, and the funny thing is, to this day, I don't even know how I played the rest of that game, which is crazy. Yeah. I only know I played the rest of the game because there's film of me playing the rest of the game. You know what I mean? So I'm like, well, how did I know what plays I was running? <laughs> I, don't know. I think I think yeah. uh, I'm pretty sure Waddle has a game like that where he got his. Actually, I, I'm 100 percent sure Waddle has a game like that. Look, Waddle Waddle played at a time where like if you, if you could move your leg, you were back on the field. Um, yeah. But like, I think he had like a really good game. Like he had like four catches in the second half for like 60 something or 70 something yards and a touchdown. And he was like, I don't remember it. The only reason I know it happened is because my wife told me in the hospital later. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Like how you can like and and it's I mean it's it's scary, you know what I mean? At the same time, but it's yeah. so crazy that you know the we're, we're the the NFL. I mean, you're the best of the best. Tip yeah. of the spear, you know what I'm saying? And guys, you, know, you can you can you can you know be disoriented like that and still go out and, and finish a game and play at a high level. Yeah. But being un, being able to understand the complexity within the offense and then being able to go out there and execute and you're not 100. percent and then I don't even remember what you did. Like, I have no recollection of playing the rest of that game. I got crushed like a can. You know what I'm saying? I, I have no recollection of who, of who was that against? What, what, what team was that against? Oh, it was funny. It was the Vikings. It wasn't the same game that uh, – <laughs> it wasn't the same game that Adrian Peterson ran for 200 yards on Lance Briggs' head. Oh, oh but, uh, just on Lance. It was just on Lance. It's on him, man. I blame him for that game. <laughs> To see what's to see what's to come at me with some beef, man. Nah, yeah, yeah. Uh, nah Briggs was my guy, man. But uh, I, I think it was the funny thing is, like, look, you can tell I don't remember. I'm still probably disoriented from it. <laughs> and I can't. I want to say it was 2008, maybe 2007 Vikings game. We're at Soldier Field, but uh, yeah, I got crushed like a can, man. That was probably yeah. Uh, if it was 07 as soldier, that would have been that same game that he ran 224, wasn't it? Because that was AP's rookie year. It wasn't his rookie year. It had to be the maybe. It so was it was 08, 08 then, probably. Yeah, it had to be 08. I don't obviously I don't remember, but uh, I got cut. <laughs> on the hand. But but <clears throat> who did it? Who did it? Who did it? I got hit by uh, EJ Henderson. He crushed me, man. He crushed <laughs> me. But to 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 that point though, you talk about toughness and grit. I yeah. stole the game for my team. I don't remember staying in the game for my team, but I obviously I did. So, you know, I, you know, I like think that's, said, I think that's more important. Like realistically, yeah. your subconscious was, I'm going to be out here fighting for my brother. You didn't even know what's going on. <laughs> 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 hey, Jason, wait, you, you're not on defense, bro. You're not on defense. Huh? <laughs> I'm just playing, baby. Oh, I'm just yeah. out here. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is, I think if, uh, man, who says that? Uh, the funny thing is, it, it's, it's not funny, you know, but at that time, you know, I remember my team was like, man, we thought you were dead. <laughs> we thought you were dead. <laughs> and I'm like, well, dang, did you try to help me up? Or did he, you, he hit you that hard, no? Did you try to help me? And I, and I don't want to, you know, I'm a high school coach, and yeah. I know a lot of parents out in Chicagoland have issues. You know, football is kind of a sport where numbers are down and things of that nature. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to scare people away. Football is the greatest game. I mean, the equipment that we have now in terms of the helmet technology and, yeah. and the way they they – they made the game safer. I mean, it's 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 a great game. It's a safe game, man. You can you can get a concussion falling off a skateboard. You know, I almost get, I almost got a concussion playing golf because I'm so terrible. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> so 
So, hey. How, how you do that, dog? How, well, you, like, you, know, you know when you're in the trees, you hit that ball in the trees, that golf ball in the trees, and you try to yeah. – oh, I, I can get this ball out. I can get it out. It, it hit off the tree. It hits off the tree, and you know, that ball almost comes back at you. That's how you can almost give yourself a concussion. You know, you got to have quick reflexes, but that's how you can almost give yourself a concussion in golf. Oh boy! It, 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 when you when you look at the game that you guys play, because I, I I tell people all the time, right? Like football is not the same game, and it's to me why Tom Brady is is at this point the greatest quarterback of all time because he was able to win in that game and the modern day game. When you look at the differences in in the games, right? Do you feel like how kind of Tom Brady said where it's so offensively driven now? that it takes some of the teeth out of the defenses. Cause we don't see those great defenses mm -hmm. like we did that was giving up like seven points a game back in the day. Yeah. It's more of an offensive league. Do you like that? Do you like the game now? Or would you like more of a mix of how it used to be? Yeah, Minus I mean, the concussion stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm an obvious, obviously an offensive guy, but you know, I'm old school. So I like the way the game was played and it is, it is an offensive game now. You know what I mean? Offenses have all the advantages because now, I mean, Look at it nowadays, and I, I'll just talk. I'll, I'll start from a passing game standpoint. These receivers, they 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 really can't get hit when you look at it, right? So back in the day, yeah. if you took, if you you know took, if you decapitated a wide receiver across the middle, you got praise for it. You know, your yeah. guy jumping up and down, your chest pumping after the play. Now you can't do that. That's a penalty. That's a penalty. So now you have guys hesitating to make that big hit or to make that play on the ball because they don't want to get that penalty. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That was just second nature. Those are the things that secondaries used to look for back in the day. Those are the things that got guys contracts back in the day. And you look at it from a defensive line standpoint, right? You literally now in, in today's NFL, you literally to sack the quarterback, you have to literally pick him up and lay him down like a baby. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You can't be too rough on a quarterback. It's rough in the past, right? And how many calls have we seen this year? Terrible calls where you get a sack and they call rough in the past. You're like, man, what is he supposed to do? Is he supposed to tuck him in and and, and you give him a pacifier and burp him like a baby and lay him on yeah. the ground in order for it to be a sack. You know what I'm saying? So I, I grew up in the era, and, and I know the older guys did too, it, it, that, you know, the game, it's, it's a physical game. Um, you know, the guys are going out there. You know, you're not intentionally trying to hurt each other at all, but you're going out there, you're going out there to play fast. You're going out there to play physical. You're going out there to make plays for your team. And I think some of the rules in place now hinder guys from being able to do that. So I think, you know, yeah. with those rules, we're still seeing – guys potential being handcuffed so to speak because they can't go out there and execute at a high level because of the rules in place yeah it, it's it's crazy i i think i talked about this right like uh i think as soon as we when we first started the pod and stuff like that and i know i've talked about it over on the breeze is your best defense is still give up 30 yeah your best defense right like everybody complained the year that pat mahomes went out and and gets to the super was that the Super Bowl? Yeah, against the Super Bowl versus the Buffalo Bills. Mm -hmm. Um, or was that the second round? One or the other. But that was the best defense versus the best offense. And the best offense went out and put up their, you know, 35th point of the game to to win the game. That's not how it used to be. And I think that it is, right? Like, I agree with how Tom Brady said it, where like you that slight second of hesitation in the NFL is all a wide receiver needs That's it. to be gone. That's and it. it and it changes everything. And I, I think back, like, after Briggs was talking about the AP game, like, I just went, I went through and watched the AP game. It was bad. It got bad. I'm not going to lie. But mm -hmm. then I watched, right, like, just some of, like, Briggs' plays and stuff like that. And one of his biggest highlights is him laying out Calvin Johnson, catching a football over the middle. It wasn't dirty. It wasn't ugly. It wasn't. You know, like he he was out to intentionally hurt him. He hit him with his shoulder, and Calvin was laying on the ground. Right. That's a penalty in today's NFL. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure, most definitely. Which and is, that, is that that's crazy. the part that it it's. I like the game with the offense, but I did like the game where you guys, where players could hit each other. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's different, man. I mean, you 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 can't even nowadays. You can't even wear. You know, there's only so many padded practices that you can have now. You know, yeah. I can recall back in the day, training camp, when we had true, uh, true two a days, you know, we're practicing in pads two days, <laughs> two days, yeah. you know, uh, two times a day, two times a day. Right. Yeah. So it, it's a lot different. Um, you know, it, it's set up now for obviously player safety. I think it's a great thing. 
Um, it's set up. It, it helps the players now to have longevity. So there, there is some 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 positives about the way today yeah. the NFL is going. Obviously, they're trying to place more emphasis on the players, which is I'm a former player, so I'm all for that. Um, but you know, I do miss the way the game was played. But for you, even as a high school coach, right? Like, because that I mean, it's trickled all the way down basically right. to to <laughs> grade school at this point. Yeah, is it right? Is that slight moment of hesitation? dangerous because in that slight moment of hesitation as a defender right guess what they don't call the penalty on the offensive player for laying mm -hmm. out the defender so if you're a db and you're going to make a tackle and you don't want to get the penalty on that even as a high school coach right like how do you coach that into your kids to be like you still got to be aggressive but like i i guess tackle them the right way <laughs> yeah it's i mean the whole way it's a whole new way of tackling nowadays you yeah. know so like all the drills that you know especially as a, as a, as a coach who grew up in the game you know back then like everything that you knew from a fundamental standpoint in terms of tackling and things of that nature, you had to learn and you had to learn a new way, right? You got to learn a new way because you have to teach the new way. You know what I'm saying? You got to get your head out of tackling now. You know, back in the day, it was is get your head across the bow, put your head on the football. You know, now you're not doing that. It's more, you know, chest up, head up. You're trying to get your head out of it so that way you can limit the amount of concussions uh, players mm -hmm. are having. So, and as a coach, it's a lot different. Because, you know, you were taught one way for a long time, but now you got to teach, you know, these kids the new way. Yeah. You know, so you've got to relearn it and you've got to reteach it. You know what I'm saying? So it's definitely tough, man. It, it, it's definitely uh, it puts hesitation out there because now these kids are thinking about, hey, I can make this big hit. I want instinctly I should make this big hit, but I can't because I don't want to yeah. get a penalty. So, yeah. you know, that's that's I think that's the drawback from some of these new rules and things that's in place right now. It's definitely going to be interesting to see kind of how the game continues to evolve. We got rule changes every year in, in this mug, a bunch of rule changes this year as well. So hopefully we just keep seeing it. it, it I think we saw it with a little more, a little more teeth last season, but I mean, it's still a, it's always going to be an offensive game. The offense is just more fun for a lot of people to watch. And at the end of the day, it's about the product on the field being entertaining, but Hey, that's yeah. another episode of the Chicago Bears podcast, Wednesday edition. Me and McKee back in the building. I think we dropped some fire today. I think we did some good stuff out here, man. <laughs> I sparked the beef, apparently. I sparked beef. Let's keep it going. Now, now what's the question that we got to ask Lance? Yeah, yeah I didn't even know it was I didn't, I didn't, I'm not a vegetarian, so if he wants it, we can get it. <laughs> That's like they, they did that TikTok skit. It's like, oh man, you welcome to the family cookout. What'd you bring? Uh, I brought beef. It is like his fist wrapped in aluminum foil. <laughs> hey man, follow us on everything at ESPN Chicago. You can follow me on everything at Path the Designer. Follow Jason McKee on everything at J Mac, right? J J M A C K. Yeah, J M A C K. Three seven. Three seven, man. Love, love interacting with the fans, and you know, appreciate you guys supporting the show. Hey, man, keep tuning in with us as always. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Big Bird Don. Let us know how you guys feel in the comments below about everything we talked about today. Peace. Peace. Bear down.